Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good that we are here together this morning. As we begin, not only with welcome, we share the peace of Christ with one another. And so I invite you now to share a word of peace with your neighbor. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us turn to the call to worship. Call us again, Lord. Call us again, Lord. Let us worship God. Let us begin singing, O Lord, our Lord is 409. Let us bring our prayers before God this morning. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for accepting us for who we are, no matter what. Lord, you are ready to welcome us in all of our messiness, our sinfulness, our anxiety, our struggle, our weakness. There is no love as great as yours. But Lord, even as we revel in your love, we hear you calling us. We hear your loving call to correction. Redeem our mistakes, O God. Forgive our missteps, correct our faults, challenge our fears. Let your love lead us into lives with more joy and more hope and more compassion. As we seek you this morning, meet us here in love so that we not only hear your call, but respond with courage. Receive us, receive our worship, all through the mercy of Jesus Christ who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debtors. We forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. As certain as dawn follows the night, so does God's forgiveness come to us when we approach God in humility and ask for mercy. This is good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
Now, shall I take this microphone or the microphone is all good down there? It's all okay down there? Okay. Now let's see. Do I have a friend to share the children's story with? I think that's you. Come on. And this actually, do you know this lives at the church? I found it in the bookshop. Uh, and it is a Bible, and it is really, really, really old. It looks old, doesn't it? It looks kind of old. Uh, okay, so uh, what's this one saying? Uh, good News. Good News Bible, right. And um, is it the same as this one? It's bigger, definitely. It's called to make your holy Bible, which is Good News Bible. It has a different kind of a thing. Um, this one, you know why this one's popular? I remember this from when I was a kid. Uh, it has some drawings in it. Uh, and books are good when they have pictures, right? So that's all good in there. Uh, oh, speaking of pictures, what is this one called? The Comic Book Bible. Comic Book Bible. Okay, how many grown-ups have read the Comic Book Bible? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Have you read the Comic Book Bible? Today you can, I'll leave it with you and you can try it. How about this one? Can you read that one? This is all pictures, all the time. Look at that. That's cool, right? Yeah. Do you think it's the same as these two? No. No, just different. Okay. How about this one? Now I'm going to read this one because it's harder. The Contemporary English Version. God's promise for people of today. <coughs> what do you think? What do you think it is? I don't see any pictures. It's a bit different, right? It has these funny things. Okay, how about this one? The Illustrated Guide to the Bible. Yeah, I'm thinking more pictures. Oh, look, the display is all kinds of bits and pieces of words and pictures in this one. So, it's really small. Yeah, they're really small. But at least they have pictures. Yeah. So these are all, what? They are all Bibles, and they're all different. Did you know there's a bazillion kinds of different Bibles? There's not just like one Bible. And that's because all of the scripture that you have, it was written at a different time, but it was in different languages. It was not, it was not in English. Right? It, it was a different, it was in, uh, it was in different languages, and it had to be translated, you know, like if we spoke Italian and English was translated into French or something. Um, and so that's scholars, they've done that. But they've also done other things, right? And they've, they've used uh, pictures sometimes, <coughs> There's also something really neat that happens. I, I'm going to show you a magic trick. You ready? I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord. And Look at that. It was magic. <laughs> and that's because this is what's at the center of every church service, the word of the Lord. And we use different kinds of Bibles, and we use different Bibles for different things. So I, when I'm preparing my sermon, I might use a really academic translation because some of these things are really careful. But there are other translations, like this contemporary one, that might be nicer if you just want to read the stories and you want to get the sense of it. And so it's translated a little bit differently, so it reads a little easier. But then, if you want, as a kid or a teenager, you want to look at the pictures and the comic book one, that would be way better, right? Um, but all of them are really important because all of them are about one big thing. They're about God, but in, in particular, they're about the love that God has for the whole world, for individual people, the whole thing. And so it starts with the story of Noah's Ark and you know, creating the world, and goes all the way through, and all of Jesus, all the way until maybe the end time, when all of this disappears and Jesus comes back again. So it's a very, very interesting book, but it also is the core of what we do at church every week. Now, I want to make sure that the grown-ups know that all of these came from the library back there, 
And if you've only ever explored one kind of Bible, I would encourage you to try a different kind, a different version, different language. Maybe you want a comic book Bible. Uh, there's a Lego Bible out there. There's all kinds of good ones. Um, but I think that's really great. And I think it's something we can thank God for, that we have this beautiful word from God that we can explore in lots of ways. So why don't we say our prayer, and then you can have the comic book Bible to read. Deal? Deal. Okay, let's fold our hands, and you can say it after me. Dear God, thank you for the Bible and all the ways you share your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I think we're going to say that you need Christ. So you do that. As we come to our scripture readings, we ask for God's wisdom and help. Let us pray. Lord God, your word is beautiful and hopeful and challenging and reassuring. And we pray that now as we read your word, you would come to us by the power of your spirit so that we might hear and understand and respond to your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is interesting. I have a different first reading than you do. Oh, no, maybe? Do you have the Deuteronomy reading? Okay, let's just skip the Deuteronomy reading. That, that, that will, because I, I do have, I have three readings, but I think I've skipped over Deuteronomy. Let's jump into the psalm. Do you have the psalm? Perfect. Uh, let us read responsibly. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians. So we turn to the New Testament and the first letter to 
those in Corinth. Chapter 8, the first six verses. Do you have six? Yes, you have six. Excellent. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offers to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. Amen. And finally we turn to the Gospel according to Mark in the first chapter. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we were talking about the Bible this morning, and some of you will know, I didn't know this until I was much older uh, and almost headed off to seminary, the Bible has four books that we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Each Gospel tells the story of Jesus' life, beginning with the birth and beginning of his ministry all the way to death and resurrection. But each book is different because each has a different author telling the same story, but each author has a different way of writing. And some stories about Jesus appear in all four of those books, and some of them only appear in one. They've been left out by the others. And each one has its own language. It each has its own emphasis, each book. And it's especially true when we come to the reading today from the Gospel according to Mark. So having passed through Christmas, we've done the wise men, we've done all of that good stuff, Um, Jesus was baptized, all of that. Um, We're thinking now about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And each of those four books chose to highlight a really important thing as Jesus begins his ministry. So Matthew, when he tells the story, he begins with the Sermon on the Mount, um, like the Beatitudes. Do you remember that one? Blessed are those who... That's how Matthew begins. Um, It's a very long speech, but it really tells us that Jesus is a loving and compassionate and wise teacher. That's how he's, that's how he wants to tell the story. Luke, however, addresses uh, his hometown by quoting scripture about the poor and the oppressed. Because Luke, and you'll see this all the way through the Luke account of Jesus' life, Luke understands Jesus to be all about welcoming those who are on the margins. So he has a different way of telling the story. John, John uh, is a fun gospel. He starts out with a wedding. He starts out with a big party, and that's, remember Jesus turned water into wine? There there is John. Um, And he understands Jesus to not only be a miracle worker, but someone who loves deeply and enjoys people and also loves a good party. But Mark, Mark is different than all of these. Um, He doesn't begin with a party, and he doesn't begin with a sermon. He introduces the beginning of Jesus' ministry with angry words and an exorcism. Now, Jesus was a devout Jewish man, 
We, we know that. And as all devout Jewish men did in his day, they went to synagogue. And uh, they went on the Sabbath. And at this particular day, he even had an opportunity to go forward and to be the one to read scripture. They say he did it as someone with authority. Now, I imagine that Jesus was a good preacher, a good, a good lay reader, any of those things. Um, charismatic, probably. I imagine Jesus to be really likable. Like, I bet if we got to hang with Jesus, he would be just a great guy to, you know, pass an afternoon with. He was the son of a carpenter, but he, clearly we learn he had all kinds of ideas about things. He had opinions, and he really loved to tell stories. He was an avid storyteller. People probably listened to him on that day in the synagogue with rapt attention. People were also irritated because what happened is somebody at the back, at the back of the room started to heckle. Now I've only been heckled once. I actually was he like genuinely heckled once. Um, I was preaching in a downtown Toronto church and there was somebody who'd come in off the street and they took exception that there was a woman preaching. And so there was, there was a bit of a kerfuffle, um, slightly uncomfortable. Uh, however, if you can imagine that day in the synagogue, there probably was, you know, an audible gasp <gasps> because somebody was interrupting uh, their worship and, and their, their reader. And I'm sure everybody turned, because we would do the same thing, everybody probably turned and look, where was that voice coming from? And there were probably people, you know, giving the stink eye. Uh, you know, moms can give a stink eye. Everybody really uh, in church, usually we have those skills. Um, but while everybody sat there. There was nothing else going on. They probably were waiting for an usher. Like, we would probably do that. I would probably do that, wait for an usher to come. Um, in fact, when I was heckled, that's what happened, is someone else uh, helped the person who was, uh, who was shouting. But Jesus does not stop and wait for the usher to do something about it. He actually stops what he's doing in the middle of worship, and he addresses that person straight on. And right there, it's the middle of a very dignified worship service, I'm sure, and Jesus hollers from the pulpit, he hollers from the front with a complete lack of decorum, and I know who you are, he says. I know who you are, I see you, I hear you, and I'm not having it. And it's just not how we expect any of our preachers to behave. You don't expect me to holler uh, at anybody. You wouldn't expect me to interrupt what I was doing if there was somebody at the back shouting. And it's not how we would do things generally in Canada. We're very polite in Canada. We would never shout at somebody like that. Um, we also would be incredibly uncomfortable, right? Canadians are not terribly comfortable with uh, very big displays of emotion, um, particularly if it's anger. And I suspect then or now there would be a lot of squirming, you know, feeling uncomfortable. Um, you know, oh, look at the time, uh, and trying to get out the back door, that probably would be our response. Most of us don't like, I don't, we don't like confrontation. And we would rather that our worship and our meetings and, and our work life and our home life, we would rather that it was all cheerful. We'd like it all to be happy. And we want everybody to get along. And we don't want to have to deal with someone who is angry in our midst. We don't want to have to deal with someone who is weeping in our midst. We don't, have to, we don't want to deal with pain in general. There's a friend of mine <clears throat> who preached a series of sermons about Christian cliches. It's all part of God's plan. There's the ever-popular... God helps those who help themselves. You know that one. My personal favorite, everything happens for a reason. Those sayings actually drive me completely crazy. Clearly they drive my friend crazy or she wouldn't have been preaching about them. Mostly they drive me crazy because they are basically not true. Those are expressions that are not uh, reflected in scripture. That's not where they come from. They are rarely helpful and sometimes they are actually hurtful when people use them. But we use those sayings because they help us solve a problem. Repeating a trite phrase like that, it shuts everything down. It shuts down the whole conversation so that we don't have to deal with being uncomfortable and squirming in our chair anymore. Cliches help us to avoid the pain of the moment, whether that's a death or a crisis, 
or a, an argument or an illness, the funeral home is one of the places that you hear those phrases a lot. Um, my husband being a funeral director, you hear these things a lot. Ask any parent who has lost a child how many times people use those cliches in conversation, particularly at the funeral home. Things like, I've heard this one, God needed another angel. As if that mother did not need her five-year-old to grow up with her. Sometimes I have seen a very, very well-meaning friend respond to someone by saying, don't worry, even though you're crying and your life is falling apart, don't worry, because God won't give you more than you can handle, when clearly God has already given them more than they can handle. If we are honest with ourselves, those sayings and those phrases, they're very well-meaning, but they are meant to shut people down. They are meant to end the pain. They are a polite version of please stop because I'm upset and I can't solve this and it makes me uncomfortable. Now there are other ways that we avoid facing trouble um, or troublesome people. How many times have you heard an offensive joke? It makes fun of someone. It's maybe told out of hate or out of, maybe out of ignorance and you responded by changing the subject instead of actually addressing the person who has said something that is unkind. I, I have done that. Or how many times have you been in a meeting? I've been in the church for 25 years. How many times have you been in a meeting when a bully shouts and carries on? Maybe there's a fist on the table. And your response has been to look at your hands, to look down and just be quiet and hope somebody else will say something and make it stop. Silence, of course, means that the situation usually continues. And I have been there, and I have been that person staring at my hands. And my guess is that Jesus liked it when everybody got along. My guess is Jesus loved it when people were having a good time, when people were at peace, when people could exchange their ideas in you know, great invigorating conversation. He was happy to participate and revel in community. Unless, unless there was something more important going on. And that day in the synagogue, there was something more important going on. When Jesus stops what he's doing and he addresses the pain in the room, the demon-possessed man, who knows if that would be translated in our day, our day as, a, as a, someone struggling with their mental health. But Jesus knows that the comfort of the people in the pews was less important than calling out the evil spirit that man was struggling with. Jesus knows that if he stops and directly addresses that person, that situation, that pain, then things may next change for the better. It is a precursor to redemption. It is the Good Friday before Easter morning. And that is really important for us. It's an important word for th those of us who don't like public outbursts. You know, somebody who's crying makes us uncomfortable or somebody shouting makes us uncomfortable. Maybe somebody simply sharing a really difficult, painful story. Because when Jesus was faced with difficult emotions, when Jesus was faced with maybe difficult behaviors, he didn't use cliches. He didn't stare at his hands. He didn't quietly exit outside. He didn't ignore that man at all. He didn't pretend like he didn't hear him. He was straightforward. He addressed it straight on, and he was filled with compassion. And he was ready to respond to that pain with a healing word. The story, it, like I said, it's at the beginning of Mark's account of Jesus' life. And that story, writes Dr. David Loos, that story is one that sets the tone for everything that follows. Jesus has come to oppose all the forces that keep the children of God from having the abundant life that God desires for all of us. And that is our good news for this morning. Jesus did not come, as most of us understand, to be nice. 
Jesus did not come to sort of tuck away those difficulties or sweep them under the rug. Jesus came to confront suffering. He does it all through the Gospels. Jesus came to act with strength and with mercy so that the door to healing was opened. All of us will yet be faced with more uncomfortable situations. I hope I am not heckled again. Uh, but there will be more uncomfortable moments in our lives, whether that's at work, that's at home, it's at school. We will face pain. We will face loss. We will face struggle in the people that we love. Human life is full of those moments and those struggles. But when we do, when we come to those moments, may we try being like Jesus this time. Instead of reaching for a cliche, God won't give you more than you can handle, instead of changing the subject or leaving the conversation or leaving the room, may we have the strength to hold space for those who are struggling with whatever it is they're struggling with. May we offer a calm haven and a steady voice and a spirit of deep compassion. It might be at the funeral home. It might be at church. And it might be at work. It might be at our friend's place over a coffee. May we refuse to dismiss or ignore pain when it is in front of us. And by doing so, may God help us to open the door to healing for each of us, for all of us, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit that is so capable of redemption and resurrection. May God help us to make it so. Amen. Let us sing about God's call. Number 634, will you come and follow me? us bring our prayers of gratitude and our prayers for each other and for the world to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we receive your word today, and we hear that you long for healing and wholeness for all of your people, and you encourage us with your compassion. 
hear our prayers today. We pray for healing among nations, for global leaders who make deals and sign treaties, that you might inspire them to honesty and integrity, to place the needs of their people in front of economic interests or ego. We pray for healing among men and women, for those who have suffered at the hands of another through sexual assault or harassment, for those who work within court systems seeking justice, for married couples who are struggling, for therapists and counselors and authors and pastors and all those who help those who struggle. We pray for healing in our church and the churches in our presbytery, for those who have been hurt by the church and its people through acts of bullying or discrimination or exclusion. We pray for those who are working to make the church a place where everyone is welcome and all gifts are valued. We pray for healing among our families. Lord, help us to cultivate homes where honesty and humility and compassion help us to change destructive patterns and open the door to healing old wounds. Lord, we know that your world needs healing. Your earth needs healing. Your people need healing. And so in silence now, we name those places and those people known to us who long for your healing touch. Lord, we are so grateful that you come to us in love, that you lead us toward hope, and that the great power of the Holy Spirit inspires confidence in us. You are healing your world, O oh God, piece by piece, moment by moment. We rest in your good news. We trust in your mercy all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. And a early happy Valentine's Day to all of you. It's Valentine's Day this week for those of you who might have forgotten and need to remember. Next Sunday, February the 18th, we'll be offering a lay service. Our topic's going to be family. And that's timely too because Monday is family day. We're going to have a light lunch following the service. And so if you'd like to bring something to contribute to the lunch, you'll please feel free to do so. Also, it's going to be casual, so be prepared for some other things. I think somebody's arranging games, which would be ideal for family day. And I'm asking you all to, if you have family visiting, bring them along and bring along your best smiles because we're going to take a church family picture, okay? So that's next week. Then our annual meeting is scheduled for March the 3rd, following our communion service that day. And be sure to mention this again to your neighbors and other members of the congregation so that we have a good turnout for that annual meeting. And I believe we're having a lunch then that day as well. 
We also have a few announcements from Fielton, uh, Field, uh, can't even talk today, uh, Fielton um, Strabane United Ch Church, uh, the Freelton group are having a guest speaker on March the 3rd at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. That might be a little tight for us with our annual meeting, but if you know anybody who's interested in hearing Dr. James Tyler Robinson um, uh, speak, please mention that to them. Also on March the 16th, this might be more interest of interest to you, they're offering a Irish stew dinner. Okay, so that's March the 16th between 4.30 and 6 p.m. Irish stew to supper. Then in on June the 1st, they're asking us to tentatively keep that date because they're having uh, or planning an antique and craft show. So they're looking for people who have antiques and who have crafts who would like to s submit them for their sale. I've put all the information on the back bulletin boards so they have the telephone numbers and more details if you want to take that information down. Is there anything else to announce? Nope, okay, so we'll see you next week then for the lay service, right?
It's not something I do often, but let me quote John F. Kennedy. As we express our gratitude, he said, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. So we come into this moment and we remember all the giving we have done this week, whether that is in the church offering plate or in our action uh, since last Sunday. And we gather all of that up and we offer it to God as a gift. Let us stop in prayer for a moment and dedicate all of that giving. God of all times and places, God of creatures great and small, we come with gratitude for the love you bring into the world and into our lives. And we pray that you will receive all that we offer, all of the love that we share. Lord, we honor you in all of our giving, and we pray that you will use our giving to glorify and honor Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we offer our gifts and our prayers. Amen. I think they call it an oldie goldie, do they? Shall we sing together? Will your anchor hold? Oh no, what a friend we have in Jesus. We could, both of those are oldie goldies, but I, I do like the 746. What a friend we have in Jesus. go from this place in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and keep each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>